హెల్లో గాయస్ వెల్కమ్ బ్యాక్ టు బాజీరా వైఎస్ అకాడమీ ది హిందూ న్యూస్ అనాలిసిస్ సో టుడే ఈజ్ ట్వంటీ ఫిఫ్త్ మే ట్వంటీ ట్వంటీ ఫోర్ అండ్ టుడే వీ హ్యావ్ మోస్ట్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ అండ్ వెరీ ఇంట్రెస్టింగ్ న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్స్ టు డిస్కస్ సో వితౌట్ ఎనీ డిలే విల్ స్టార్ట్ డిస్కసింగ్ ఆల్ దోస్ ఇంపార్టెంట్ న్యూస్ ఆర్టికల్స్ వన్ బై వన్ నౌ బిఫోర్ డిస్కసింగ్ దెమ్ లెట్స్ ట్రై టు సాల్వ్ ఎస్టర్డే గివెన్ ప్రాక్టీస్ క్వశ్చన్ I have also asked you to answer this question in the comment section. So please try to answer such questions in the comment section so that you will also actively participate in answering these questions and that will ultimately benefit you in your examination. Now the question was windfall tax is very often seen in news and which of the following statements best describes these windfall taxes. Now during COVID-19 pandemic what happened? during covid-19 pandemic there are certain sectors which have benefited significantly due to the covid-19 pandemic and the lockdowns and the shortages that were created during the covid-19 pandemic and in fact one such sector which has benefited enormously was oil crude oil sector so because due to lesser demand the prices of crude oil fell down and that was in fact now uh, benefited a lot of oil refinery companies now in fact the government imposes these windfall taxes on the profits which are unanticipated unexpected for example imagine a company a and the company a due to the uh, global situation or uh, any other volatile conditions in any part of the world or any other reason if it makes profits enormously for a very short period of time or within a very short period of time so then those profits are known as windfall profits and the tax that is being imposed on these windfall profits is known as windfall tax for example company a adopted a business strategy an investment strategy and due to which the company has earned some profit so that will not come under the windfall tax rather an unexpected unanticipated profit that is being made by company a in a very short period of time taking advantage of the existing conditions global as well as the domestic conditions and that comes under the windfall tax category so the correct answer for this question is option b because option b is more suitable for the windfall tax here now option b says that a tax which is being imposed by the government on specific industries when they experience unexpected profits so any industry which has got unexpected profits in a very short span of time then those profits will be taxed by the government under this windfall tax category so i hope it is very very clear for all of you now we'll try to understand very briefly what exactly is this windfall tax means a windfall taxes are designed to tax the profits of a company okay so again i'm giving the example of company a now company a benefited from the external or internal events or unprecedented events for example the russia ukraine war and even the covid-19 pandemic and israel uh, you know and uh, the gaza strip conflict so because of all those factors if any company benefited and the company makes a huge profits in within a short period of time the uh, the government will impose this windfall taxes on the companies now for example the energy price as a result of russia ukraine war okay so energy prices have been enormously increased due to the russia ukraine war because that has created a lot of demand uh, in the global economy so therefore the oil refinery companies have significantly benefited because of the russia ukraine conflict and these are the profit that cannot be attributed to something that a firm actively did okay so it is not a company's a long term plan to earn profits rather these profits are sudden profits unanticipated and unaccept uh, un uh, you know intended profits that a company makes now this windfall is defined as unearned unanticipated gain in income through no additional effort or no additional expenses from the company side so one area where such taxes have routinely been discussed is oil markets 
where the price fluctuations within the uh, you know oil markets or the volatilities within the oil prices have actually enabled certain companies to make a huge profits and the government will come up with these windfall taxes to tax on those profits which are be, which are being made by any company suddenly now today also i have one more practice question so the question is consider the following statements about the international court of justice now this is also very very important question now the first statement is says that the seat of the court is at the peace palace the hague netherlands second question, uh, second statement of the six principal organs of the united nations it is the only one not located in new york united states and third statement says that the hearings of the international court of justice are always public now please try to answer this question in the comment section and i will provide you the correct answer in tomorrow's class but just try to answer this question in the comment section right now without delay let's try to discuss all those important articles of today now first we'll start our discussion with the india middle east economic corridor so india middle east economic corridor is one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects it connects india with far up to us right so it it connects india with middle east or western asia and then europe so because of that reason it is considered as one of the ambitious projects of government of india and the west asia and europe and in this particular project us has also involved because it is one of the connectivity project and it is also considered as a game changer because now it is now connecting india with the european markets west asian markets so that will also further ensures the supply chain resilience the required supply chain resilience so that is very very important here the supply chain resilience because we will not just depend on few countries in the southeast asia or you know on china rather we are resili uh, we are making the supply chain more and more resilient and we are also diversifying our raw material sources now understand this on may 13 2024 india and iran finally signed a 10 year long term bilateral contract so we have also discussed that in previous classes that india and iran have signed a 10 year chabahar port agreement for the operation of chabahar port and in fact it was inked between indian ports global limited and port and maritime organization of iran on behalf of iran right so in fact this particular chabahar port operation agreement between india and iran is one of the game changer because it is not just bridging india with iran rather it is one of the critical economic route that actually links india with the afghanistan mid central asia and then the larger europe and if you look at the central asia central asia is very often known as the resource rich region and therefore it is very important for india to access central asia and chabahar port actually plays a very important role as a bridge between india and central asia and larger eurasia now india middle east economic corridor we'll understand very briefly about this india middle east europe economic corridor now you can clearly see this india middle east europe economic corridor how it has been passing through the different countries that right? you can clearly see this on the map now this india middle east economic corridor was signed on the sidelines of the g20 summit so we all knew that last year india hosted the g20 summit the president of g20 summit last year was india so with a a theme of uh, one world one family one future so that was the theme one world one family and one future so i hope all of you know about this theme of the g20 summit so this is the theme of the g20 summit and this is also in line with the larger philosophy of vasudhaiva kutumbakam vasudhaiva kutumbakam so that is the entire world 
is one family also daiva kutumbakam means right so this was launched in the g20 summit in new delhi on september 9th 2023 and in fact there were number of countries which are actually part of this india middle east and europe economic corridor so the countries include european union all the countries which are part of the european union france germany india italy saudi arabia united arab emirates and united states now all these countries are part of the india middle east europe economic corridor and this particular project is very very important for india because this project connecting india with the cent west asia and the larger europe so therefore since it is a connectivity project so it can stimulate or further enhance the economic development because through this project what we are doing we are enhancing the existing connectivity or we are also exploring new connectivity options from india to middle east and the western europe and the eastern europe and at the same time it would also result in economic integration of different countries between asia arabian gulf and europe okay so this is asia arabian gulf and europe so it will result in the faster economic development of different regions through enhanced connectivity and economic integration also so this india middle east europe economic corridor will actually comprises of two different corridors okay so the first corridor is an east corridor and this east corridor actually connecting india to the arabian gulf right so this includes the eastern corridor so this eastern corridor connecting india with the arabian gulf and then there is a northern corridor also this northern corridor is the second corridor and it is connecting the arabian gulf with the europe so i hope it is very very clear for all of you that this india middle east europe economic corridor have two sub corridors or two separate corridors so one is this eastern corridor and the second one is the northern corridor right so eastern corridor and the northern corridor to existing maritime and road transport routes now they actually connect the existing the india middle east europe economic corridor actually connect the different existing maritime and road transport including the railway routes so that we will be able to establish a an integrated network of transit so it will include the railway network also because that particularly aims to be a reliable and cost effective cross border ship to rail transit for example so we cannot build a road from india to united arab emirates or saudi arabia rather so we need to ship goods from india to saudi arabia or united arab emirates through the ship okay so that is the ship route and from the ship route we will take these goods through a land route right so overall it is a ship to rail transit network for goods and services to transit from one part of the uh, region to the other part and in fact this particular corridor also envisages a long railway route and laying down the cable networks cable networks for the communication and connectivity and even building the pipelines for transporting clean hydrogen from one region to the other region now we all knew that government of india launched national hydrogen mission now the one of the objectives or the targets of the national hydrogen mission is making india a global hub of the green hydrogen okay so therefore across uh, the corridor the pipelines will also be built or pipelines will also be laid down to transport clean hydrogen from one region to the another region and in fact the india middle east europe economic corridor actually includes several indian ports now what are those indian ports the indian ports including kandla mumbai and mundra so all these ports on the western coast of india will be connected by sea links to fujairah 
Jebel Ali and Abu Dhabi in UAE. So they were actually port cities in Abu Dhabi. Okay. So one port in uh, you know United Arab Emirates, including Fujairah, Jebel Ali, and Abu Dhabi in UAE in the east. So after that, they will be followed by a railroad link through Saudi Arabia and Jordan and onwards to Europe in the west by port of Haifa in Israel. and along with the ports in marseille in france messina in italy and piraeus in greece now understand these are the different ports through which the goods are being transported from one part to the other part okay so in fact for example from uh, imagine that from kandla to mumbai okay from kandla to mumbai the goods will be transported and then the goods will uh, transported to united arab emirates so in a united arab emirates especially uh, to this fujira jebel ali and abu dhabi in the united arab emirates right now after that they will be transported through a road link up to the saudi arabia saudi arabia and then jordan so saudi arabia jordan and then onwards europe in the west by the port of haifa in israel because understand that israel has been sharing its borders with the mediterranean sea so therefore the goods will be transported to the haifa port of israel and from the haifa port of israel then the goods will be transported to marseille in france and messina in italy and piraeus in greece and in fact overall it is a 4800 km long india middle east and europe economic corridor and this particular economic corridor actually aims at securing the regional supply chains right now understand that you know securing regional supply chains in the sense that when we have integrated these different supply chains we will not be able to depend on one particular country for our raw materials for example we have been significantly or disproportionately dependent on china for various raw materials including the active pharmaceutical ingredients and also the rare earth metals as well so therefore when we integrate multiple uh, economies with the indian economy what it makes so it ensures the supply chain resilience and the supply chain diversification as well so therefore it aims to secure the regional supply chains and it will also increase trade accessibility of different countries and then a trade facilitation would also be uh, possible through this india middle east europe economic corridor now understand so it secure the regional supply chains of these different countries trade facilitation trade accessibility will be further enhanced this india middle east europe economic corridor will actually help us overcome the obstacle of you know uh, frequent supply chain disruptions and at the same time it will significantly cut down the cost of transporting goods from one part of the region or one part of the world to the another part of the world so it significantly cut down time and it will also significantly cut down cost so that is how trade can be significantly increased with any country for example uh, if it takes a lesser time lesser cost to transport goods from uh, india to middle east or india to uh, europe then of course the indian goods will become more and more competitive compared to the goods from other countries and that is how we can significantly boost our exports to these countries because it is cutting down the time required the distance and the con cost of transporting or transiting goods from india to europe and in fact experts have also believed that the india middle east europe economic corridor is one alternative for the chinese belt and road initiative it is not just an alternative to the belt and road initiative but it is also a counter to chinese belt and road initiative in the region so therefore a us 
is also one of the major stakeholders in the India Middle East Europe economic corridor because US is a very eager to counter China, China and Chinese ambitions to gradually expand its influence, its hegemony in different parts of the country through these infrastructure projects, especially the Belt and Road Initiative. And in fact, one positive and significant aspect of the India Middle East and Europe economic corridor is that US is also one of the stakeholder. So therefore, that would give a further push in faster implementation of this India Middle East Europe economic corridor. Now, however, recently Middle East has become an instable region, a volatile region and this is particularly because of the war between Israel and the uh, Gaza Strip and at the same time the tensions between Israel and Iran. So because of all those factors, it is said that the India Middle East economic corridor implementation is being delay uh, delayed and in fact uh, the geopolitical experts have also been commenting that the delay in implementation of the india middle east europe economic corridor is especially a cause of concern right so it is a matter of grave concern because implementation of this particular project will actually neglect the implementation of the project over a period of time. So we all knew that the war in Gaza broke out on October 7, less than a month after the announcement of India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. Now, in fact, US President Joe Biden also linked the attack of Hamas on Israel to this India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor. Because if India Middle East Europe Economic Corridor is started implementing, then it would integrate Israeli economies with the other West Asian and Europe economies and that would further legitimize the existence of Israel and therefore the world will not recognize the demand, the separate state demand of Palestine. So that was the one factor which was the key motive for Hamas to attack Israeli civilians on October 7. And in fact, during this particular war between Israel and the Gaza, Hamas based, uh, you know, militant group, Hamas militant group, Hoitis, they were rebels in U uh, Yemen and these Hoiti rebels are also backed by Iran. Now, we very often hear that the Hoiti rebels of Yemen have actually blocked the ships of Israel and its Western allies from access to the Red Sea. Right. So if you can carefully look at uh, into the map. So uh, this is Red Sea. Right. And this is where Yemen is located. And when ships have been sailing from the Red Sea uh, into the Gulf of Aden, the Hoiti rebels have been blocking and attacking those ships. Okay, so that is a grave cause of concern. And in fact, the Hoiti rebels have actually blocked the ships belonging to Israel and its Western allies accessing the Red Sea. And in fact, US has also deployed its US Navy along with several other European countries to especially normalize the situation in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. However, these efforts from US and other European countries have not deterred any of these rebel groups and they further continue to attack the ships of Israel and its allies or, or its Western allies. So therefore, the Israel and its Western allies have been forced to take a longer route access. So that include traveling all the way from the Cape of Good Hope to the Indian Ocean. Now they can easily pass uh, from Red Sea and then they can easily enter into the Arabian Sea. But now they are coming all the way from the Cape of Good Hope in Africa to Indian Ocean. And this has increased the shipping time as well as the insurance insurance cost of the shipping companies. So that has further increased the cost of raw materials also. So that has further increased the cost of raw materials and the shipping time has been taking a long duration, a very long duration and shipping cost uh, increased, shipping times have been increased. 
सो ऑल दीज फैक्टर्स हैव बीन क्रिएटिंग चैलेंजेस फॉर द इंडिया मिडल ईस्ट यूरोप इकोनॉमिक कॉरिडोर and at the same time the same period iran has repeatedly threatened to close this strait of hormuz okay so they threatened to close this strait of hormuz now where this strait of hormuz is located now if you can uh, look at the map bro so this is uh, saudi arabia yemen woman uae and somewhere you can find iran also so this is iran and this is persian gulf and this is known as strait of hormuz so if you can look at the map you can clearly identify the strait of hormuz now iran also threatened to close down the strait of hormuz and strait of hormuz is very very important for the global energy security because most of the uh, you know containers carrying oil they just pass this strait of hormuz and strait of hormuz is largely controlled by iran and due to the conflict in the west between israel and palestine or hamas so uh, you know iran has also threatened to close the strait of hormuz in the north through which most of the crude oil and natural gas is shipped to the other parts of the world so that including india so therefore it is a huge concern for us as well a similar situation happened during the persian gulf crisis in 2019 also so this has actually caused due to you know uh, iran forces downed one of the us drone so that has also resulted in a, a conflict or tensions in the persian gulf and in fact this is very very important remember this indian navy has launched operation sankalp what is the objective of this operation sankalp so operation sankalp is aimed at uh, you know uh, the safe passage of indian ships through the red sea and gulf of aden and then into the arabian sea so therefore it would secure our energy security and at the same time it would also ensure a reliable passage of indian ships and that will also ensure our supply chain resilience right so this operation sankalp in order to ensure the safe passage of indian flagged ships so those ships with the indian flag so the, uh, the safe passage of those ships can be ensured through the operation sankalp through the persian gulf and there were also armed security teams from indian navy on indian flagships transiting the persian gulf region now in this particular context the india middle east europe economic corridor is no doubt is a futuristic and at the same time one of the path breaking initiative that actually integrate multiple economies through road ship and come uh, rail networks because it is not a small feat when india is being integrated with the economies of west asia and the europe and it will also significantly cut down the time and the cost of shipping goods from one region to the other region and therefore we must build on the wave of reconciliation within the west asia so this wave of reconciliation in west asia is triggered by abraham accords that is being mediated by us so under this abraham accords us try to bring together israel saudi arabia uae egypt and other different countries that include qatar because they very often have this conflictual relations and us try to bring all those countries together through this abraham accords so this conciliation was triggered by this abraham accords and this could be an ideal uh, you know foil not only for chinese belt and road initiative but also useful tool for better integration of economies of all these countries and integration of all these different regions and it will insulate from threats posed by the connectivity due to the conflict now in this context also with respect to india middle east europe economic corridor we must insulate this particular corridor from the threats posed by the regional conflicts that we have been observing in the middle east now the missing links of this india middle east europe economic corridor which are being highlighted or the threats or the shortcomings drawbacks which are being highlighted by the gaza of war on this india middle east europe economic corridor actually add a layer of insurance to this ambitious project so therefore we must understand these shortcomings and drawbacks of this particular project and then take steps accordingly 
so that the trade between these countries will not be disrupted and integration would result in peace and prosperity economic development among all these countries now next also we have another very important article so this is with respect to the antarctica and the probability of increasing tourism in antarctica and you know how increasing tourism in antarctica will actually uh, you know uh, influence the continent and its fragility now it is it is in context because recently delegates from 60 different countries have actually convened or they have come together for a meeting in kochi kerala to attend the 46th antarctica treaty consultative meeting so this will be the 46th antarctic treaty consultative meeting and that is expected to go on until the month end so it will expect it to go on the entire month and in fact it is an annual affair and you know the essence of this particular meeting about all these antarctica treaty consultating or consultative meeting countries so or total 29 countries that have actually right to vote on affairs which are concerning the management of the antarctica continent okay so all these countries have the right to vote on affairs which are concerning the management of the antarctica continent now understand antarctica continent is uninhabited continent so there were no human settlements rather antarctica continent is a global common now when i say global common what exactly is this global common means global common is the asset of the entire world and everyone can access the antarctica and no country have exclusive rights over antarctica so therefore other attendees of this particular 46th antarctica treaty so other countries all will also attend this particular 46th antarctica treaty but most of those countries are non voting and observer status countries okay so as well as independent environmental experts are also invited as uh, and also invited the functionaries okay so all these people will meet in kochi uh, for the discussion on the antarctica especially on tourism now one of the interesting points of the agenda of this 46th antarctica treaty is related to the tourism in antarctica and regulation of tourism in antarctica and in fact so all these 26 countries of the antarctica treaty are a group of like minded countries so they actually includes india also okay so antarctica treaty countries include india also and they pressed for a proposal to introduce a regulatory framework which is governing tourism in the continent right so it is being governing tourism in the continent now when we talk about antarctica so as i have already told you that there is no indigenous population or own indigenous population in entire antarctica continent and in fact the millions of hectares of untrammeled ice so everywhere ice so entirely uninhabited island and at the same uh, uninhabited continent and at the same time it is completely covered with ice and it is also geographically isolated region in the south of the globe okay so in fact it is not uh, uh, in fact it is not in tourist list and at the same time it is also not an elite's regular private jet gateway now there is a less tourism in the antarctica and in fact that is one of the factor which has protected or further enhanced the fragility of this antarctica continent now antarctica is the only continent that can be described as wild continent and its secrets buried under the kilometers thick blanket of ice right so antarctica also holds a lot of potential for the research on different or wide variety of aspects now in fact uh, one of the uh, you know uh, researcher he spent 90 days underwater and in antarctica so it is said that he turned out to be 10 years younger so that is also uh, one of the significant aspect that we have uh, seen in, uh, in news recently. So the Antarctica is now the wild south that the wealthy travelers aspires to. Now wealthy travelers now looking to travel to Antarctica. 
and in fact if you look at the data of the number of tourists who are visiting antarctica so that has actually increased from 8000 in 1993 to 1 lakh in 2022 and apart from that more ships and more people mean that more man-made pollutants so that include plastic pollution and other kind of uh, emissions into the atmosphere and environment of the antarctic continent and at the same time there are also rising instances of accidents and disasters that would lead to upsetting the unique biodiversity and environmental fragility of the antarctica continent okay so increasing human activities and including the number of tourists into the antarctica so therefore there is an urge to preserve the pristine purity of the antarctica continent and therefore it is the responsibility of the all member countries in the antarctica treaty including in india to preserve the pristine purity of the continent so the treaty's commitment to disallowing the territorial claims okay so there will be no territorial claims entertained or allowed from any country and even the unexpected future circumstances uh, affect a change in terms of the presence of more people from one country influence the terms of their favor for example imagine that you know in antarctica continent us is uh, antarctica treaty us is one member and imagine that more uh, travelers researchers started settling in antarctica so then there is a probability that us would likely change the treaties of this particular uh, us would likely change the treaty provisions of the antarctica treaty in its benefit because more travelers and more uh, researchers from usa are settled in this particular antarctica continent so that is a concern that in future the circumstances may affect a change in terms of in case of presence of more people from one country influence the terms in their favor us may uh, you know uh, influence terms in its favor because of the presence of you know uh, a very high number of people from that particular country so a proponent of the proposal india must be wary of any deal that could undercut the future opportunities from the tourism okay so therefore india should be wary and india should be fully committed in protecting the pristine purity of the antarctica continent and at the same time the antarctica should remain as a global common and any country uh, which is trying to change the terms of the treaty should not be entertained by the other countries as well because antarctica is a part of a global commons now next very important news article is with respect to heat wave now this heat wave is also very very often in news and in fact more than a dozen people uh, have died due to this heat stroke or heat induced illness that happened in gujarat so as a severe heat wave with temperatures which are ranging from 45 degrees to 47 in fact 45 degrees to 47 degrees of uh, you know temperatures in any part of the country they are considered as one of the highest temperatures and those temperatures will lead to the heat wave like conditions okay so these heat wave like conditions will have negative impact because people would die with the heat stroke and even the heat induced uh, you know illness and this particular increase in the temperature sweeps throughout the state of gujarat and in fact because of the heat stroke uh, it is said that around three people were died in ahmedabad on friday now what exactly is this heat waves now imagine that imagine a place or a region called ye now the average temperatures of ye is 38 degrees celsius during the summers so therefore if there is an increase in around 5 to 6 degrees celsius temperatures from its average temperatures so that would actually create heat wave like conditions in a place or a region called ye and that is how the heat waves are being defined right now heat wave is usually measured relative to the usual climate now here the usual climate is 30, 38 degrees celsius okay so that is the usual climate of the area ye okay so uh, to normal temperatures for the season 
and in fact high humidity often occurs due to heat waves as well as uh, heat waves heat waves will also result in high humidity of that area and high humidity in fact further aggravate the existing heat wave condition so this is especially in the case of oceanic climate countries the countries which have been experiencing this oceanic climate and in fact heat waves have become more frequent and they are also more intense over the land and in fact across almost every area on the earth in the 1950s and heat waves occur from climate change now climate change is also responsible for the increasing intensity and the frequency of heat waves across the globe now what are the major causes of these heat waves so heat waves are actually caused uh, due to the high pressure area at one single place for example a high pressure area is being created over the area or region a at an altitude of 10000 to 25000 feet and it actually strengthens and retains or remains over a region for several days up to the several weeks now in fact global warming has also been triggering this heat wave like condition okay so global warming what it has been making global warming is increasing the average temperatures of the planet earth so that is pre primarily driven by a number of human activities those human activities including burning fossil fuels coal oil natural gas deforestation industrial processes so all these factors uh, emitting carbon into the atmosphere and increasing the global temperatures and thereby they have been contributing to the increasing intensity and frequency of these heat waves. Now global warming will actually lead to the overall warmer temperatures and making extreme heat events more likely. And in fact, the climate vulnerability is also one of the reason for increasing intensity and frequency of these heat waves. Okay, so natural climate variations such as El Nino, La Nina events can influence the weather patterns and they can also increase the likelihood of these heat waves in different other regions. Now we have discussed what exactly El Nino, La Nina in our previous lecture. Okay, so during the El Nino events, the warmer ocean temperatures, warmer ocean waters in the eastern Pacific can lead to the changes in overall atmospheric circulation and even the weather patterns worldwide also. And after that, the geography and topography of any area will also significantly impact the heat wave conditions. So certain geographical, certain geographical features and even topographical conditions can contribute to the development of heat waves. For instance, the landlocked valleys and regions which are surrounded by mountains can trap hot air and lead to the temperature spikes in those regions. Okay, so changes in wind patterns, for example, shifts in wind patterns can actually transport hot air from one region to another region and intensifying the heat waves in the areas that are not typically prone to such extreme weather temperatures. So there are certain measures that can be undertaken. So those measures include a possible public health measure. So that is setting up air conditioned public cooling centers and heat wave action plans at the grassroots level or, you know, decentralized uh, heat wave action plans that must be taken up at the urban areas level and even the block level and novel designs for cooling systems. So that are actually relatively low cost and they do not use the electrical components. Okay, so all these factors would certainly provide relief for the people and protect them from the harmful heat waves and heat strokes. And in fact, uh, adding air conditioning in schools provides a cooler workplace for students. It can also result in additional greenhouse gas emissions unless solar energy is used. We can also explore the possibility of using solar energy. So not to venture out during these extreme heat conditions and also keeping oneself regularly hydrated will actually help us save ourselves, safeguard ourselves from these extreme weather conditions. Okay, so that's all in this lecture and thank you so much. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and also hit the like button. Thank you.